Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Putting it all together. Presented by Jesus on the 10th of August 2013 in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session one, part one. My brother's in Byron, so... How are you today? Good? Me? Am I good? I'm not 100%, no. I've just got to... Yeah... Not much. Not many people want to hear any truth, so my throat's starting to close down as a result. But we'll uh, see how we go today with you hearing some truth. And what we'll do first is a bit of uh, housekeeping stuff before we get started. Welcome today. How many of you? Uh, is this your first time? How many of you? First time? Just a few of you? Yeah. And how many of you have only listened for the last six months or so on YouTube or... Yeah. Most of what I say today will not apply to you. <laughs> so you're off the hook. Does that make sense? <laughs> when I say it won't apply to you, when I'm talking about people in the audience or the percentages of people that are doing this or that, um, obviously you're not included in that. Does that make sense? Because obviously you, you've just heard and knew uh, the divine truth. And, but we would like to welcome those of you who are new along. And uh, all myself and Mary do is just give seminars. So um, there's nothing strange about what happens at a seminar, as you've probably seen when, if you've looked at on YouTube. Okay. We also have uh, some, what would you call it? A documentary team, shall we call you? Thomas, Siri? Yeah. Um, Thomas is uh, um, a person who's doing a documentary from the UK. He travelled over for this week. And um, so he's with it, been with us for a few days in the UK already and also here in Australia for the last few days. And Simon is his cameraman. So camera, he might be moving back and forward along this side of the hall in particular. And he's happy if you ignore him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the guys are just doing a documentary which they're hoping will be on one of the channels in the UK, maybe the BBC or Channel 4 or something like that. So that's what they're doing a documentary for. And if you would like to be uh, interviewed by them, um, they're happy to interview any of you that want to be interviewed. So you can approach them just in the break, you're fine with that. Um, yeah, so in the break after the first few hours of chat today, um, they're happy to be approached. And they're happy for you to say anything you'd like to say, even if it's negative, actually. All right. So, after today, you might have a lot of negative things to say. <laughs> Is that a due warning? <laughs> What's the talk today going to be like? Um, the, if we can also just, uh, myself and Mary, uh, where is, where is, we got the mic, you're not doing a mic, oh, there you are, so I, I can see where you are now. Um, myself and Mary, obviously we, we did finish up going to the UK um, at the expense of ITV, which is a channel sta uh, uh, TV channel in the UK, and they flew us there and paid for a few nights accommodation and the rest of the time we stayed with some friends. And... Um, we were finished up being interviewed, I think, for about seven minutes. <laughs> it was all that for seven minutes. And, uh, and then we were interviewed the next day by Sky News a few times and the following day after that by some radio, a radio show. And uh, it was a pretty busy time, actually. And then, of course, we started filming with Thomas's team, Thomas and Simon, so uh, it was a pretty busy time. And then as soon as we got back from... Uh, the UK, we had to go to Adelaide, which we had previously booked before we went to the UK. And so we didn't get any sleep. And, 
so I, I don't get any sleep when I'm flying, um, generally. So I didn't get 48 hours sleep on the way there and 48 hours sleep on the way back. And then because of the change of the time zones and everything, we probably didn't get much sleep when we were in Adelaide either. And so this is why my, my throat's a bit like it is at the moment, a bit furry. So I'm sorry about my furry throat today. You might have to put up with that, as if that's not enough to put up with uh, for today at least. And the subject of the material that we were going to talk with you today is what I feel is a really important subject. Um, but it's not going to be a complete discussion of the subject. And the reason why is that myself and Mary have decided from, from now on that what we're going to do in the seminars is different to what we'll be doing when we do shows that we present on YouTube. And so what we've decided is this. We're going to, in the future, mostly present new material where myself and Mary are discussing the material together uh, and we're filming it in a, in a studio. And, or, and by the way, the studio sounds fancy, but it's actually Lena and Igor's lounge room at the moment. <laughs> and, uh, and that's the way it is. But uh, we'll film the material, present that material, and then what we're doing is visiting locations that, where we just do question and answers with the audience. So that way any person who's a member of the audience has a chance to ask questions about the material. And, uh, and so pretty much all future seminars, for a while at least, will not be presentation of new material. They'll be just interaction with the audience, answering questions from the audience. Does that make sense? And the presentation of new material will be done between myself and Mary and maybe some other people involved at different times on a YouTube or on a, on a video that we put on YouTube. And remember that you can get those videos uh, on a disc if you want all of those videos. So um, that, update, that updating process is continuing to, to operate. So you can still get updates of all the material that way or you'll have to download the material from YouTube or watch it on YouTube and then if you come along to a session, um, feel free to ask questions that are either personal or general in nature. So we're happy to answer both. Of course, everything is still going to be filmed. So if you do have a general question, um, then, then obviously there's not much drama when it's filmed. But if there's a personal question, <laughs> then obviously you might want to be circumspect about what you ask because I will definitely answer it. Um, in the public setting. So, so feel free to do it, but understand that you are going to be filmed during that process. Okay, are there any questions about just basic things before we get proceeding on to the subject that I want to discuss with you today? Yep, Jen, thanks. If we, if Mike's, uh, Fab's got the mic, so if you just leave the hand up. If you can remember to leave your hand up. By the way, any of you left your mobile phones on? Can you please turn off your mobile phones? That would be good too. How did you feel that your trip to the UK, were you welcomed over there and how did you feel that the interview went for both you and Mary? Well, it was interesting. The UK media is very, very different to the Australian or the US media. The Australian and the US media seems very intent on just lying as much as they possibly can get away with and then, and then hoping that nobody will really you know, answer the questions that they're really asking. They, they really, inter the Australian media in particular, is into making statements to you that you've got to somehow, you know, in five seconds, say that are false, basically, and it's a pretty much difficult and impossible to do that. And they just basically want a few, what I would call, you know, advertising grabs, so that they've got something to advertise and, and, and sell. Uh, whereas the UK media has been very different in that regard. Um, all of our interests, we've had quite a lot of interactions now with the UK media, both uh, television and radio, and they seem to be very much more focused on asking sincere questions uh, about, you know, about things, even if there's a short period of time, like there was on ITV. There was a large degree of sincerity and respect coming from the people who were asking the questions, whereas uh, and that's not always the case. There's been a few radio shows in the UK that are not like that. But, but generally, there is a lot more of that, you know, than there is here in Australia or what we've experienced in the US. So, um, 
we're not sure why that is, but there is some laws in the UK that prevent them from doing certain things that here in Australia they get away with. And here in Australia they have what's called a code of practice, which is not a legal document. It's actually, it's got, there's no legal terminology in it, there's no legal framework from a governmental perspective. And so that means that pretty much if they don't go along with the, the code of contact, nobody really checks them to see whether they have gone along with it or not. In the UK, the code of conduct is illegal. So, so there, there's obviously differences with the way in which the UK media can interact. But not only that, we found that they were generally, not all, but generally more respectful uh, and more considerate, actually. Uh, with, the few, with a few exceptions. Um, so, yeah. Um, in terms of what, how we felt it went, well, we only went because we felt it was just an opportunity for our own personal growth um, to confront some things that we both felt we needed to confront. One of them is uh, being a bit more in the public limelight, which we both have a tendency to want to avoid still. And so, you know, we felt it was a great way of confronting that, sitting down in front of telly in front of a million viewers or so. Uh, we felt that that was a great way to confront some of those emotions. So Mary worked, in particular, worked through quite a lot of emotions before we left in New Zealand, and, and, uh, and I had to work through some after we came back, actually, about uh, some of the treatment from the radio stations in particular. But, um, so we went primarily for our personal growth, but we also managed to share a bit of truth you know, as much truth as you can share in five minutes or ten minutes. Uh, we had an hour interview with uh, a radio show, Talkback, but that was pretty negative and he was pretty negative as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of it is just for our own growth, really, that we're engaging these particular things. And the beauty of it is that we got to also um, do a seminar while we were there. So, so we did a seminar with around 50 people were present uh, while we were there. So basically enabled us to do a seminar in London without us having, or anybody else having, to pay for us to get there or come home again. Um, although we probably paid a bit in terms of our personal welfare, <laughs> probably, because we just squeezed it in between other things that we were doing. But yeah, it went pretty well, I think. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen it, um, but uh, it went fairly well, I think. A lot of times the they don't hold up their agreements that they have with us after we leave. So the agreement that we make with most of them is that they should um, give us a complete recording that we can put on the YouTube channel ourselves of the entire proceedings. And it's, and it's very rare that we actually... They all say yes and they all agree up front, um, but then when it comes to actually getting the recording from them, there's all sorts of excuses and a lot of times they just generally ignore us so they don't, we don't actually finish up getting what we want from them. And if that, if that, when that happens, we just don't do an interview with them again until we get what they agreed to give us. Basically, that's how we, we are with them. And the main reason why we do that is because we feel like we like to have a record of what's going on most of the time. Because we're tired of not having a record. That would be right, wouldn't it, Dalen? And, um, and then finding out later that people have, you know, they're often... Um, falsify the information. How many of you read the Sydney Morning Herald article by Matthew Siegel? How many of you felt that it was a fairly fair article, probably a pretty accurate article? Any of you? No? Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Like, there's probably about 30 errors in that article, at least 30 factual errors in that article. Um, and, and they don't care about that. But in the UK, they can get into trouble for that. Um, so, and they can get into trouble without the person who they've been um, lying about uh, having to get a lawyer in order to do it all because they can go to a government body and have all of those things corrected. Whereas here in Australia, you really have to go and get a lawyer to correct anything the media says, which obviously we're never going to do. So, and they know that, so, so they have a tendency to get away with quite a lot. Mm. But yeah, in general, it went pretty well, I feel. And we had a good opportunity to meet up with a lot of new people, new faces in England. Um, and uh, since then, I think there's been around 400 extra subscribers to the YouTube channel. Normally, it takes about a year for 100 new subscribers to come to the YouTube channel. 
and in the last two months there's been 400 new subscribers. So it's made a bit of difference in terms of the amount of exposure, I suppose, that Divine Truth gets. Because um, normally it takes a, it's a very, like over nine years prior, um, we had at just under 900 subscribers after nine years. So, so that's about 100 subscribers a year, so not a huge amount of subscribers. And um, in the last two months, we've had about 400 new subscribers. So it's made a little bit of difference to that. But uh, there's not much interest in them asking any question aside from questions about our identity, which is unfortunate. Like, we feel that we, we managed to get in principles about divine truth in the process, but in the end, the primary focus of most of them is to basically just talk to us about our identity or, in the case of many, make fun of our, you know, what we're saying about our identity. So there's not much interest in actually finding out the truth about what we teach. Um, and we feel when, when that changes, then there'll be a lot more interest in the truths rather than in myself and Mary personally. Yeah. Which is what we're looking forward to, actually. Yeah. So we're hopeful that that will happen sometime in the next 10 years. You never know, <laughs> never know. <laughs> we don't have a strong attachment to things growing rapidly or changing rapidly. You know, the reality is, as many of you know, now, you, at, at the beginning, you thought, oh, this will be a breeze. A year or two later, you'll be there, right? That's how you thought. And then five years later, some of you are going, yeah, maybe it's not such a breeze after all. Isn't it, that how it is? And, um, and so you realise how strongly entrenched we are in our own addictive behaviour and how strongly entrenched we are in gaining the approval of the world that surrounds us that, that we're often very stuck when it comes to progressing in love towards God. And, and so, you know, what we originally conceived, how easy it might be to do so, and later, of course, we find out that it takes some time, particularly on the earth, to progress towards God in an environment that is so negative and cynical, uh, particularly cynical about God, and particularly cynical about love, in fact. There's a lot of cynicism about love and God and as a result it's quite difficult to progress on earth because it, you're just constantly surrounded by this cynicism. And then of course as you know from a few, well about, it must be nearly 12 months ago now, we had that talk about positively responding to spirit influence. You remember that talk that we gave? And the reason why we gave that talk was because we be believe that a lot of people are getting heavily influenced by spirits without being really aware and in fact, uh, we've, to we've talked to spirits who say they play you like a puppet. So they say that generally many of the people who come along, they are just playing like a puppet. You know, they're just triggering a certain addiction and before they know it, the person goes off and does something that's out of harmony with love without even thinking and a lot of times being influenced by the spirits to do so. And... Um, and so, you know, we find that there's a lot of that kind of influence going on. And of course, the longer you don't deal with something, the worse it gets. So, you know, if you deal with something straight away, you know, there's a very short period of time when you have a bad experience, generally. But if you hold on to it, delay it, do, you know, try to drag it on for years and years and years, you don't want to face certain things for a long period of time. And this is part of the problem that many of you are experiencing now you drag out the process and you get hammered by not only people on earth but people in the spirit world all that time to change your mind. And that the, takes a lot of energy out of you. You know, it makes you feel tired, exhausted and all those kind of feelings. A lot of those feelings come from this feeling that you're in a long, drawn-out fight with negativity. And the reality is the only thing that's drawing out the fight is the lack of humility to your own emotion. But, but most of the time we don't see it as that. So this is some of the things I'd like to talk to you about today. So what I would like to discuss with you today is this subject. Um, I don't know what I said on the net because I haven't had a chance to have a look at what I said um, on the net for some time. But um, it's a relationship uh, with God. 
So it's part of the Relationship with God series of talks that we wanted to discuss today. And I want to call it Putting It All Together. And this will be session one. Putting it all together. Does that sound fair enough? Good, good chat, to have a chat about that. Now, I want to say at the start of this discussion that many of you are going to walk away today and feel really upset, actually. And you'll want to be angry with me. Some of you will want to be angry with me as a result of today's discussion. The reason why is I'm going to be very blunt with you as a group, particularly the group of people who have been listening for years now. I in particular want to be blunt with you because I feel that many of you are avoiding deep issues of truth in your personal life. And this is what is causing many of your current problems. And so I want to discuss with you the reason why these things are happening and what's really going on. And to do that, we want to look at how to put your relationship with God all together and then actually dissect where we're not doing it, to be honest about where we're not doing that. Because if we're not honest about that, then of course you spend another five years listening without really making any changes. And during that period of time, you'll have a lot more spirit influence on you to, to conform to their way of life and their way of thinking and so forth. You'll have a lot of pressure from earth and you'll feel very unhappy. And the reason why many of you actually have felt quite unhappy is because of this already. And, and when, the more you delay your own progression, the more unhappy you become. In fact, and so what I want to do is discuss with you, frankly, what's going on. And to do that, I want to remind you of the five basic things you need for progression towards God. What are they? Well, let's start with the most important one. What's that? A desire to love, isn't it? Really? So, so let's put that there. So love. Would you put truth or humility as the next more important thing? I think I'd put truth myself because, because truth to me is, I mean, here we're talking about God's truth, not your own. And to me, it's only God's truth that will set you free. It's impossible to be set free by your own truth. You can only be set free, free through actually coming to experience and feel God's truth. So that's the next important thing. Obviously, as many of you have pointed out, humility is so important in that process because without humility... And remember, what is the definition of humility? Can, can you remember that it was the definition regarding emotion in particular that we need to focus on? The willingness to feel every single thing you feel as it really is, whether it feels good or bad, is the... It, that is a part of humility, not the only parts of humility. Myself and Mary have done a five series interview, which is available on the internet, um, of all the different parts of humility. And many of you, I would advise to have a look at that again, actually, if you haven't had a look at it already. What would you say are then the next two most important things that you need for your relationship with God? Faith and, and will. Okay, so these are the things we discussed with you last time, remember? Okay. <clears throat> now, many of you have a false concept of your own condition. And in particular, the false concept for a few of you is that you actually think your condition is worse than it actually is. But for the majority of us, we actually think our condition is better than it actually is. Right. Now, what I would like to do is be honest about condition. Because if you are not honest about your own condition of love, how is it that you'll ever develop a true desire to change? You need to know where you are before you, need, before you can know where you're aiming. But also, you need to know where you're aiming before you'll take any action. So if we look at uh, this issue of love, what are we aiming for? 
if we're, if we're on the divine love path, if we're, if we're following this pathway that God has made to become at one with God, what are we aiming for? It's quite obvious, isn't it? We're aiming for becoming at one with God in love. Right? So at one with the way God loves is what we're aiming for. If we can just have a mic, uh, come down just, and put your hand up so, and have a mic, that's fine. Yeah. So that I'm just new here. That's fine. And I touched on your stuff about three years ago. Yeah. Um, the emanation, is that what you're talking about? So that we're emanating God's love. So the energy that God is providing to the universe comes through us. No, it's not about the energies God is providing. So, so remember, for most of the people here, they would know that God actually provides lots of different forms of energy. And love is one of those forms. And what I'm talking about here is in particular the feeling of love. God has feelings of love for all of God's creations, including yourself. And that feeling of love can enter you and transform your soul to such an extent that you feel the way God loves and you actually finish up loving the way God loves with other people. And, but that's not energy, if you understand. Uh. So you, it is a form of energy, though. It's a form of energy, and but it's... if you focus it as energy, what you're going to finish up doing every single time is ta going away from that it's a feeling of love. So, so most people find what they do, talk, they talk about energy a lot, but they forget that it's emotional. Like, love is an emotion. It's not just energy. It's an energy, a feeling in motion. It's an emotion. And so what I'm suggesting to people is don't, get stuck on the energy side of things, focus on the feeling side of things, because that's the emotions, that's the energy in motion. It's still an energy, though, and it's God's energy, and it's emanating... To be honest with you, if love, you've come here to energy. argue with no, me... No, 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 I am putting a point of view forward that might be different and, to yours. And to be frank with you, this is my seminar, and my points of view will come forward. So shall I hold these till the break? No, you can them. ask tomorrow. We'll be up, have a whole question and answer session tomorrow where you can ask questions, right? Today, I want to focus on the material I want to cover. And, and it's a free seminar that I've paid for to share my opinion with you. And I'm telling to you that it's not my opinion, actually, that it's God's, but that's up to you whether you want to determine that or not. But, but if you focus, as I've spoken to many people before about, if you focus on the thought of energy you are always going to get away from the real feelings of love. Like energy is very, very different because there's all forms of energy, including your entire body is a form of energy, right? And, but that's not necessarily love. So I can't say anything more until tomorrow. <laughs> you can ask questions tomorrow if you want to ask questions about different subjects that get me off this subject that I want to discuss. Because you're, you're, you wanted to speak, you wanted to speak about your ideas about energy. I don't want to speak about your ideas about energy. I'm just trying to have a conversation. That's all. And, and I'll I'm leave not it here to tomorrow. have a conversation with I'll, you today. I'll leave it till tomorrow. Yep, that's fine. That's fine. I yep. apologise if that's caused some disturbance. No, no, it doesn't disturb me. I'm just saying I'm not going to do it with you. That's all. Yep. Anyone else have a question? No. So, this love area is becoming at one with the way God loves the way God feels for everything, everything God has created. Does that make sense? So it means becoming at one with that. So in other words, you will love in the same manner and way that God will love when you become at one with God. That's the underlying goal. Now to do that, that means that you would love every single person here the way God loves. All right? Now for the majority of us here, we don't want to do that. Not yet. You see, there are certain people that you want to dislike. Right? There are certain people you want to attack. There are certain people that you'd like to pull down. There are certain people that you'd like to, um, you know, just have a few cross words with and, and make them feel like they're the problem, basically. The, the, that's what you want to achieve many times. And becoming at one with God is not about that. Becoming at one with God is about becoming at one with the way in which God loves. 
Now, for, for many of us, it, it's got, it gets to the point where we feel that the way God loves is not achievable. Right? And for many of us, we don't even believe God loves, actually. For many of us, what happens is that we believe that God's quite cruel or God you know, doesn't engage us on a personal one-on-one -on -one level. That's what we believe. And as a result of that, we are not at one with the way God loves and we have no desire to be at one with the way God loves. And it's only the desire to be at one with the way God loves that causes us to want to be at one with God. It's only the desire for the relationship with God that causes us to have that feeling that we would like to achieve that in our lifetime. Now to do that, we have to believe what God knows is the absolute truth. So our belief systems have to change. We must become at one with God's absolute truth. This is where many of us have a terrible, terrible lack. We have little desire to become at one with the way God sees ourselves. Right? We want God to see us how we see ourselves. We don't want God to see us the way God actually does see us. We want to maintain a facade with the world, in other words. All right? And in maintaining a facade with the world, what we're doing is we are not being at one with the way that God sees everything. We are trying to falsify ourselves to the universe around us. And most of the time, we're even falsifying ourselves to ourselves. We're telling us ourselves that we're actually more developed or more loving than we actually are. We're telling ourselves that we're more um, truthful than we are. What I notice a lot is the amount of resistance to truth. It, it is extreme for many of you still, right? Myself and Mary, when we go down shopping in Kingaroy, which is where we shop, sometimes we come against some of you that we see from the audience, right? And we go to walk up to you and have a chat with you, and then we go, whoa, that feeling coming from you is... And the feeling is that feeling that you have of, what's he going to say to me now? That, you know, many of you know you've had that feeling, right? What's he going to say to me now? What, what thing is he going to say that makes me feel like I'm... Uh, no, I don't want to know. And, and what we feel from you is this wall of not engaging, not wanting to engage. Now, of course, we start to want to engage and then we go, oh, no, that wall's... Okay, I'm okay with accepting your will to not engage. And so we go, we walk past and say, hello, how are you today? And you go, hello... And you go, whew, got out of that. Right? And that's the feeling that we feel from many of you, a feeling of relief that you didn't have to talk to us. Now, many of you know that you've had that feeling frequently, right? So, and why is that feeling present? Because there is a definite resistance to hearing truth. So there's not a love of truth. There's not a desire to know new things that you don't currently know. You want, to, you want to tell people or only hear the things you currently know and have them confirmed. You don't want to hear something new. right? But God wants to share. To become one with God, you're going to have to hear lots of new things. And a lot of the new things you're going to have to hear are going to be completely the opposite and completely different than what the average person on earth believes. And in addition to that, it's going to be completely different to what, the, um, what your heart tells you is correct in many times. And you're going to have to give up things. And most of us don't want to. We want to have what we believe confirmed. We don't want to have what we believe challenged. Right? And as a result of that, we finish up in this state where we're not at one with God's truth. We want our own truth to be true. It's almost like we're having a, a, a argument with God. An argument with God. We're, we're basically saying to God, unless you change the whole universe to suit me, 
I don't want to have a relationship with you. Right? And many of us believe, in fact, that God will do that because God loves and that's what we believe love would do. Many of us believe that love would make everyone around you conform to what you want. Right? And in a minute I'm going to discuss these kind of things with you in more detail as to how we go about that. Let's look at the next thing, humility. Let's just go through that. This ability to feel all of your own emotions, this desire, in fact, to feel everything. Rather than blaming other people for your feelings. Or God. All right. And that's only just a part of humility. Like I said, we could discuss humility and we have done for, I think it's about 12 or 15 hours. Um, so there's a lot of parts involved in humility. But that is one of the things that are very important to understand. Now, for the majority of us, we don't have that desire. We only have that desire when the feelings are what we believe are going to be able to be coped with. So in other words, our fear determines how humble we are. We're afraid to go too far in any direction, most of us, in terms of how we feel. So, so what we do is we create constraints in our feelings and emotions that prevent us from feeling the way we truly feel on so many different subjects. And as a result, we're not humble. We're governed by our fear. And our fear determines how much we're willing to accept. And because our fear determines how much we're willing to feel, our fear then determines how much we're willing to hear as truth. And our fear determines how loving we're going to become. And if our fear is high, then the amount of love that we're going to finish up having is going to be very low. Because our fear will dictate how much love we can express. And our fear will also dictate how much we love we can receive. Many of us are not receiving love at all because we're so afraid of somebody loving us for lots of different emotional reasons. Most of which involved the feelings that if somebody loves us, they're trying to control us and they're trying to manipulate us and so forth. Right. So this is a big problem for, for, for many, this problem of humility. So I'll just rub out the back, next bit because we want to talk about faith. You remember in our previous presentations I've talked a little about faith and I've said that we need to have this kind of faith where we actually allow ourselves to believe that God is good. Many of us don't believe God's good. Like Many of you have learnt about the law of attraction, yes? How do you feel about the law of attraction? So when I have discussions with many of you about the law of attraction... I can feel from you that you actually hate the law of attraction. You think it's a damn mess, the law of attraction, particularly when it's imposed in your own life, right? And when the law of attraction happens and different events get triggered, you believe, many of you still believe, that, that you want to try to get away from those events somehow, try to manoeuvre around these events. So somebody, you know, you see the, the number of somebody that you don't like very much ringing you on the phone. So what do you do? Is it answer or not answer? Go to message bank. Which one is it most of the time when it's somebody you don't want to talk to? Isn't it message bank most of the time? And why is that? Why does that happen? Because we don't want to... We don't engage that as a law of God, like that we have attracted this conversation to learn something and there's a law involved and we don't have any faith in that. And so what we do is we turn off, if you like, all of the chances God's giving us to grow. We turn them all off, we shut them all down. All right? And this is what we do, because we don't have faith that God is good. And that God loves us. And God wants to um, have a relationship. We don't have faith in those things. Right? 
And then lastly, one of the biggest problems we have is that we might believe all of these things intellectually are true. You know, we might accept them all intellectually. This band is really hard to get off. And, but when it comes to exercising our will in harmony with these things, that's where we fall down. In other words, we don't have a strong desire to truly be loving. We only have a desire to be loving as long as, you know, good things happen as a result. But if something bad might happen as a result of us being loving, and that is possible, by the way, that something bad can happen from the result of us being loving, because when other people are not in a loving space, sometimes they view what you do as in a loving space as unloving. And so they have a response to that. So oftentimes what we're trying to do is we're trying to exercise our will in harmony with self-protection. We're not exercising our will in harmony with love or truth or humility or faith. Instead, we're exercising our will in a way that we try to protect ourselves from what is going on, what is happening in our lives. Protect ourselves from any what we see as future harm. We often are exercising our will in that direction only. And we will, under those circumstances, compromise. Compromise truth, compromise humility, compromise love. And many of us on a day-to-day -day basis still compromise love. We still do that. So let's look at... So this is about if we were truly wanting to put it all together, what we would do is we'd exercise our will in harmony... With God's laws. That's what we would do. That's how we would exercise our will. We would not exercise our will out of harmony with God's laws. Whether we know intellectually they are God's laws or emotionally. As soon as we know intellectually even, without us being aware emotionally, we would want to exercise our will in harmony with what we've learned. We would not keep on a giving ourselves excuses. Like one excuse that I hear from many of you is, I'm not there yet. How many times have you used that one in your personal life? You go, I know that I should do this, but I'm not there yet. I, I, you know, I'm not capable of doing that yet. And in particular, we see that happening when it comes to telling the truth with other people. Like, I know I should tell my husband that I cheated on him 10 years ago, but I'm not there yet. In other words, I'm not in the state yet where I feel like I can be motivated to do that and take the consequences. Right? That's really what we're saying. We're saying, I'm not there yet because we're saying we know that God's laws will all happen a certain way to correct our attitude and we don't really want to engage those laws in a direct manner and so we try to make excuses for ourselves. That's what we do. Now, the, the primary parts of putting our relationship with God together. Those are the primary parts. Now, it's a very brief summary. Of course, we could discuss, and I have done for hours and hours on end, about love and what love is and what love isn't and all of those different things, right? We've got whole seminars where we did whole days of what it means to love another person, whole days of what it means to receive love from God, whole days of what God's truth is. And in fact, myself and Mary will be presenting more information about God's truth over the coming months, about what is God's truth, what are the qualities of God's truth, what are the attributes of God's truth. We've talked a lot, myself and Mary, already about humility. Like I said, we've done five sessions on humility and talked a lot about what that is, what it looks like, what it feels like, you know, how, how it is. Remember, we've just done a series of talks about faith and prayer. And in those we define faith and what it is and how we can integrate that into our relationship with God and so forth. And we've also had many discussions with you about will, the exercise of your will in harmony with love. We've had many discussions about that. So my suggestion if you want to know more about those particular things is to go to those discussions and listen to them again or watch them again. Because I don't want to so much discuss with you the intricacies of each thing today. What I would like to discuss with you is the areas in which that are very obvious for this group of people, 
most, not the new persons, again as I said, but the persons who have been listening for a fair portion of time, I want to discuss with you what's really going on for you, for many of you, in terms of your own progression. Now, can I ask you a direct question? Um, how many of you feel that in the time you've listened to divine truth, you've actually progressed? Can you put up your hand where you've actually progressed in love? Okay. So, would that be the majority? I think so. How many of you, maybe I need to ask the opposite, how many of you feel you haven't progressed at all? Just a few of you? Okay, so the majority feel you have progressed at least some, in some way. Okay. How many of you feel that progression is relatively easy? No one feels that? Okay. And how many of you feel that you're sort of what you would classify as sort of struggling with it still? How many of you would feel struggling, you're sort of struggling with it all still? Okay, so the majority again. How many of you feel like it's a, a breeze, everything's going smooth, you don't have to worry? No, no one's in that category, okay. okay. <clears throat> How many of you believe that things are going well, but there's sometimes a suspicion that they're not going as well as what you hope? How many of you feel that way? Just a few? Okay. All right. Well, let's look at uh, what's really going on for the group of people who are here. Can I do that? Because I know a lot of you now, right? How many, how many have known uh, or come along to sessions now for five years? Can you, there's quite a few of you that five years. Four years. If you keep your five years up, four years. So now we're talking more than half. Three years. So if you keep your hands up. So now we're almost talking the majority who are here. Two years. So pretty much, aside from a few, there's, there's a lot of you, two years at least. Okay, so... Do you feel that the progression you've made in the time that you've listened to Divine Truth matches what you believed you would be able to achieve at the beginning of the time you heard about it? <laughs> How many of you feel that? How many of you feel that the progression that you have achieved has matched what you believed you would achieve? All right. Okay, just a few. Okay. And, then, and to be honest with you, there's good reasons for that. Because a lot of times at the beginning we have, uh, we have all these concepts that, you know, that our lives are a certain way, that we have certain influences around us. And then through the process of emotional discovery we realise that a lot of things are not what we thought. We realise we're under a lot more spirit influence than we actually thought we were. We realise that we have a lot more addictions that we believed that we, believed that we had in the beginning. We thought that we were a lot more loving, but really, when you put us under pressure, we were not that loving at all. And you find out a lot of things about yourself, right, in the process. And so, of course, what you believed about yourself at the beginning is often very different to what you currently believe about yourself. So how many of you now believe very different things about yourself than you believed when you first started? Okay, so everyone. And that's what you would expect, isn't it? If, if God's bringing you towards some truth, there would be some progress there. But the big problems that we have are not related to what we know, are they? The big problems we have are what we don't know. That's the big problems we have. And there are many issues that we face personally that we would like to ignore. And for many of us, we do want to ignore them. Mary, would you like to say? I just wanted to ask if you could explain why the big problem is the things that we don't know as opposed to the things that we do. Well, with the things that we do know, there is at least a, a consciousness from a, a, even an a intellectual perspective. From an intellectual perspective, there is some level of consciousness that there is a problem in that particular area. But the things we don't know at all, there is neither an intellectual consciousness nor an emotional awareness that it is a problem. So, for example, if I can give some examples. Many of you ladies are single, are you not? Can, you, can I just have a show of hands of all the people who are single in the audience? So, okay. So, in fact, the majority... Now, how many of you are ladies? Can you just... 
But put up your hands first, all the single people. How, how many? No, I should ask, how many of you are men? Can you just put... Don't leave your hand up, ladies, if you're a man. You're not a man. <laughs> okay, so, okay so, so the majority of the single people in our audience are women, in fact. And yet there is a fairly even mix of men and women in the audience today. But the majority of single people are women. Now, do you know why the majority of you believe you're single? Because I, I can tell you why. And if you're honest with yourself, you'll be able to feel why. Well, let's just have the microphone come and say... I like to be in control and I like to believe my mythology and I'm terrified. So you want a partner who you can control? I prefer probably someone who'd just do everything I said and right, <laughs> fall okay. into line. Well, well good luck with that. <laughs> like, I don't think that's going to That's why happen. I'm with no one. Yeah. <laughs> but see, this is where we've got to be honest with ourselves. That's, that's what we want, you see. It's important to be honest. So please don't think I'm making fun about the honesty because the honesty is very important. It's very important for us to see the real reason of what's going on. So you go, okay, I want control. I don't... So, so is control love? No. So basically what we're saying is we don't want to love, we want control. And what's the internal justification that you can feel for that? What, what's the feeling inside of you that causes you to feel that control is good? Well, I feel I'll probably... It's fear-driven. Okay. So there's fears inside of you that, feel that make you feel control is good. And because you want control, you can't love. And on, honestly, it's highly unlikely as well that there, you will attract the other half of yourself because they're going to go, do I want to be controlled? Probably not. And so they're not going to be attracted, basically, just from that feeling of, of, that's coming from you as an individual. So we know that's a problem, right? You've known how long that that's a problem? I haven't been with anyone for 20 years and I think I'm terrified. Okay, so you've known it's a problem way before you even met me, right? You've known this is a problem. And nothing's changed on that front. So what would that tell you? That I'm in error and I need to shift. But isn't it really telling you that you don't want to shift? Yes. Because if, if you wanted to shift, of course the shift would occur. So, so this is telling us where we're, let's call it stubborn, shall we? Yes. Right? Uh, I'm, choosing, I'm choosing to, to let my fear rule this. No, see, that's oh. the excuse. Ah. You see? That's the excuse. And this is where we go. We go, see, this is what happens when fear rules. We go, here's our fear. And you're saying, I'm choosing to let my fear rule. But that's just an excuse. Because the reality is, if your desire, your will, was being exercised in harmony with love, you would ignore your fear even if you had it. Does that make sense? Yes. You would ignore it. You wouldn't listen to it. You wouldn't do what it dictates. You would choose instead to do something that you know to be right. So, yes. for example, if you know that when you control or if you want to control a potential partner, you're not going to get very many potential applicants, right? If you know that for certain, then surely the most logical thing to do would be to use your will in a different direction. In other words, stop controlling, stop wanting to control. And then, of course, all your fears would come up, and if you were truly humble, you would feel them. You wouldn't hold on to them, and you wouldn't say, and you wouldn't say, I'm using my fear to determine my course of action. Because why would anybody want to use their fear to determine their course of action? It makes no logical sense to use your fear when you know your fear is not actually God's truth. It's just what you believe to be true. And so what I'm suggesting is that a lot of times we use these excuses like, I'm terrified. And that's an excuse to not have a relationship. It's not a valid excuse. It's an excuse we want to use. And the reason why we want to use it is because we don't want to love and we don't have a strong enough will and we don't have a strong enough faith that things are going to be different. We believe that every time that we engage in a new relationship, eventually they are going to either want to control us or I want to control them because they'll do things that, you know, that might stress me out and may, may make me feel certain things that I don't want to feel. Well, that's a lack of humility. 
Because if you, if you just let yourself feel everything, then you wouldn't be worried about that. So, so we, we start seeing these problems that we face, right? We start seeing them as surrounding fear, which many times they are. But what happens is we do this with our fear, and I've told, told many of you this many times, right? We make our fear God. Mm. And everything else comes behind our fear. Right? So, we like the idea of love, and we like the idea of truth, and we like the idea of becoming humble, and we like the idea of having a strong faith in God and in the positive parts of the universe, and we like the idea of using our will with desire and passion and having an expressive life. We like all of those ideas and concepts. But what we do, have done is we've placed our fear as our God, and as soon as we place our fear as our God, all those ideas go out the window the moment our fear is triggered. The moment our fear starts to come up, all we do from that point on is try to suppress it. We're not interested in using our will in harmony with love anymore. We're not interested in the truth anymore. We're not interested in being loving with our brothers and sisters, our friends, our, you know, our... Uh, the world, you know, animals and all these other things. We're not interested in loving all of those things. We're not interested in trying to maintain a concept that actually God is good. We're not interested in any of those things anymore because our fear is God. And fear, fear is not a good God. <laughs> and we know that, but, but we feel that we must conform to it every single time. And in doing, making fear our God, we are ignoring all of these things in that moment. So the reason why I ask this question about relationship is this. If I had to break up the, the whole audience in terms of condition of what's really going on inside, there's probably, I'd need to break up the women from the men, right? So because it's different for the women and the men generally in the audience. But if we look at the general condition of the majority of us, 50% of us, still have no idea what it means to practice divine truth. And I'm talking about 50% who have listened for three to five years, still really have no idea. Right? Around 40% have an idea and have made some progress, right? but their progress has now either stagnated or become very frustrating or has been dictated to by their fear. In other words, they've only progressed on the issues that you're not so afraid of. And the issues that you're terrified of, there has been little or no progress in those areas. And then around 10%, so if we said, there'd probably be close to 150 people here today, so we're talking about 15 of you, actually do understand what it means to connect emotionally to God and connect emotionally to your emotions and so forth, and actually have made continual progress, and have also started to get beyond your fear. In other words, your fear no longer dictates your action as which is something that's been a major change in your life. But there's only around 15 people in the audience who do that, actually, where their fear no longer dictates their actions, or the majority of their actions. There's still fear for all of you that dictates your actions in some cases, but there's around 15 of us on the audience that actually no longer let themselves be ruled by their fear. So that means in 150 people, there's basically 135 people who still let their fear dictate everything. That's why, remember, I think it was in 2009 and 10, I gave a whole series of talks about fear. You remember? I even had a bride's head revisited. I mean, a fear revisited. You remember that? Like a, going back to try to get people to deal with their fears. The reason why is because Fear is a major limiting factor on your life. As soon as the fear is triggered, what's happening for the majority of you is you throw away love, you throw away truth, you throw away humility. 
you throw away faith and you use your will to look after your fear, which is your God. And this is why, for many of you, you've, you've made some progress. So many of you have made some progress. Like I feel there's at least 50% of you that have made some progress that I see that it's actually... When I'm measuring progress, I'm not measuring it from the point of view of you lived here and then you moved there. Because that, to me, is a sideways shift. Right? It's still on the earth. You're a sideways shift. And, and I don't mean that you now have a different job. Well, that's just a sideways shift. I mean that you've actually become more loving and it's observable to other people. Other people feel you're more loving than you were when you began. Now, for many of you, other people feel you are no different than you were five years ago. For some of you, other people feel that you're actually worse than you were five years ago in terms of love. Right. And that can happen because when all of our fears get triggered, what do we have a tendency to do? If fear is our God, we start acting in all of our fears and we become more loving or unloving automatically as soon as we act upon our fears. So, so what my question is there with the general thing, and, and I'm going to now break it up into men and women and what's going on in terms of what's going on for the genders generally in the audience currently. So this doesn't always apply to everybody who's listening to this talk, but rather just the audience currently. But before I do that, what I'd like to do is just talk to you a little about fear and truth. And I don't know, but do you notice that fear is sort of a bit like ice? Do you notice that? It's like it feels so immovable and so constraining that it feels like you can't do anything else but act in harmony with the fear. That's what it feels like. So let's draw it as a block of ice. So imagine, and I suppose a block of ice should be blue, so I'll do that. So block of ice, here's a block of ice. Now I often liken truth to water of truth. So let's say that block of ice is floating in some water. Where would the water level be? under normal circumstances, if we're talking from a scientific perspective. Is it two-thirds? One-eighth, seven-eighths? Does anybody know? How much does H2O expand when it gets cold? Do you know? Okay. Well, let's draw it here anyway. So if this is fear... And this is the line of truth. Can you see that truth has only exposed, at this point in time, a certain amount of your fear? You've only become conscious of this fear. This is the fear you're conscious of. Does that make sense? And already, for many of you, that's too much. But it's your fear that present, prevents most of, of the engagement of all of the principles of putting it all together with your relationship with God. It's mostly all of these things, the refusal to do all of those things, which is only dictated to by your fear, that causes you to stop doing these things, which means that you no longer can put it all together, and it means that your relationship with God is affected. And This part is the only part of your fear that you've enabled yourself or allowed yourself to expose. So this is the fear you could say that you're aware of. That's what you're aware of. This is all the fear that's inside of you that you're completely unaware of. Now who is frightened about that concept? (laughs) So we're frightened about a concept that explains where we are about fear. And often we are afraid of, of what we're actually seeing. So for, the, for pretty much all of us, this is how our life is until we engage more truth. When we engage more truth, it's like draining the cup of water. So imagine this was in a cup or a vase or something. So let's put it inside of a, you know, a, a cup. There's our cup. Sorry about the... There we go. We have a, have a cup on the end, so... There we go. So that's the ice. There's the water level. There's the fear we see. Now, if you 
have more truth. It's like tipping out that water level so the water level reduces. So if the water level reduces here, what happens? The more truth happens, the more fear is exposed. Is that not true? Isn't that what happens when we start processing through issues of truth in our day-to-day -day life? We get more afraid, generally. That's what happens. Now, for most of us, we have what I would call a fear tolerance level. You notice that? Do you notice your fear tolerance level in the course of a day? Most of us have a fear tolerance level. To be frank, most of your fear tolerance levels are so strong that you're in complete denial that you have any fear at all on certain issues. That's how strong your fear tolerance level is. In other words, your fear tolerance level is so low that you will not allow yourself to be conscious of any fear that you actually have on certain issues. And in particular, there's two issues that are primarily affected by these choices and decisions that you are making collectively. One issue is this. It's the issue of your relationship with God, your belief systems with, about God that you do not wish to confront. And the second one is the, your relationship with the other half of yourself, your soulmate. Remember, that's the other half of yourself. And the third issue is the other yourself, which is your own soul. These are the three biggest avoidances that you have inside of yourself about truth. So when somebody comes along and talks to you about some kind of external truth, you go, no worries, I can accept that. That sounds really good. It's a good, greater concept, great idea. You know, that sound, I'm so fascinated about that area of study. But when somebody comes along and says, do you know that you are quite a nasty woman, actually? And if you're a woman, uh, not a man, you'll probably feel that as a, an attack on you, even though it might be true. You might be quite a nasty woman, actually. But you feel it as an attack. And so what you do is you don't want to become conscious of that because you're afraid that you are in the end. And so what you do is you rub out of your life any awareness of your own self. Then when it comes to being single versus being in a relationship, many of us do not wish to examine why we are single. We believe the main reason why we're single is because there's no good men out there or no good women out there. We believe that it's other people that are the problem. That's what we believe. Right? And if we're honest with ourselves, the majority of us do believe, who are single, do believe that the problem is there's no good people to find. Right? We do believe these things. And why do we believe these things? Because we have a lot of fear about this relationship that we don't want to uh, address. We don't want to expose. We don't want the fear to be heightened. And so what we do is we deny all truth about it. And, this, and the, most, the being we do that the most with is God. That's the reality. Many of you believe that a relationship with God is possible without having love for your fellow man or for the other half of yourself or for yourself. So many of us believe that a relationship with God is possible even though we don't like ourselves, even though we have a problem with the opposite gender or the same gender, depending on what kind of attraction it is, shall we call it, we have a problem with our soulmate attraction. And even though we treat others, who are neither of the two things first, ourselves or our soulmate, even though we treat others badly, we believe that a relationship with God is possible. While we treat other people badly. And a relationship with God is not ever going to be possible why we treat other people badly. Ever. All right. So, of course, there's degrees of how we treat people. And so if we treat other people badly half the time, then half the time we might be able to have a relationship with God. Because the other half of the time we're treating other people well, and so therefore in that interaction we can actually have some kind of relationship with God. But if we want to become at one with God, which is being connected with God all the time, 
then we must have love for every single one of those people, ourselves, the other half of ourselves, and any other person. And if we really want to become at one with God, we're not only going to have to have love for that, we're going to also have to have love for all of God's living creations. And also love and respect for all of the inanimate creations and how we deal with all of them. So in other words, uh, at some point in time, we're going to have to love our physical body. So if we're there still drinking alcohol, which is killing brain cells in our physical body, you can't really say in that place you love yourself. If you're still um, you know, getting angry with your partner all the time, you can't really say you love your partner. <clears throat> if you're still projecting at other people that uh, they're not as good as you or, or they're, they're worse than you are or you're condescending towards them, and you, and even just slightly feeling frustrated with them, then you're not loving them. Right? They're allowed to have their own will, the exercise of their own will. So this is a part of not loving people. If we're using animals and other creatures for our own benefit and we're willing to destroy their life in order to have that occur, then we're not even loving them. And if we're willing to manipulate animals in order to get things from them, we're not loving them either. So there's a lot of areas where we're not loving under those circumstances. And, and we can't expect to have a relationship with God while we're doing all those things. Because God created all those things. You, your soulmate, others, their soulmates, all other living creatures, all, everything was created by God. You can't expect to have a loving relationship with God while we're being unloving with all those things. And we're never going to be loving with all those things while our fear is the most dominant thing in our life. Because whenever compromise is put in our face, where we have to compromise what we're doing or love, we will always, if we honour fear, we'll always do what the fear dictates. We won't love. We'll always do what the fear wants. The fear has become our God for the majority of us. And the only thing that's going to reduce that is our, and improve our awareness of our own fear is truth. And what do we feel, the majority of us feel about truth? We feel, just give us enough. Isn't that how we feel most of the time? Don't give me too much, just give me enough. And, uh, and myself and Mary are often finding now, people ask us to spend a bit of time with them or whatever, and they want to ask us some personal questions. We, we generally don't do that much anymore, but um, they want to ask us personal questions and we say to them, like, are you ready to know the truth? And they say, yes. And so you start a conversation 10 minutes in, there's no willingness to know the truth, generally, at all. Because everyone has the fear threshold that's usually quite small, in fact. Most people are not willing to be challenged in any way with regard to their fears. And so, because their fear threshold is very small, you're only ever going to get to know a little bit of truth. So it's going to be like dribble, 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 dribble type of progress. Now, if you dribble progress, there's a good chance if you've started, let's say you started progressing towards God when you're 40 or 50, and you decide to dribble the progress, then you're definitely going to die before you're at one with God. If you decide to dribble it, you know, it's like, it's like drip, 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 you know, like, you know, eventually the glass will get full, but only after many millions of drips. Right? Is that what you want? And while that's all happening, of course, there's pressures, external pressures on you, trying to get you to conform to old ways of living, old ways of belief systems and everything, all these pressures going on. And sooner or later, you probably want to conform because your fear will dictate that you do. So this problem with fear is a huge problem for many of you still. Many of you are completely unaware of what you're afraid of, which is the biggest problem. Because if you're unaware of it, you're never going to feel it. And the only way you can let go of fear is by feeling it. You can't let go of it any other way. It's the same with grief. The only way you can let go of grief is by feeling it. The only way you can let go of anger is by feeling it. The only way you can let go of your addictions is by feeling them. 
That's the only way you're ever going to let go of anything, is by feeling it. And if you're unwilling to feel the fear, the grief, the anger, the addictions, then progression is not possible. And you can hear a lot of things that you agree with, but you won't have progressed. You'll be the same as you were years ago. Barbara, if you want. It's coming down the side if you keep your up. Um, AJ, I'm sitting in that area of um, unawareness of the fear and not wanting to um, go there. So would the best way to start would be to ask God to show me my true self. Would the fear be revealed in that? Most of us don't want to know our true selves. So where's the best way to start? Being honest. And just saying to yourself, I don't want to know my true self. Mm. And then what would you do if you were really wanting to progress? You'd say, I don't want to know my true self. Obviously, I'm going to have to know my true self sooner or later. What would you do next? Um, well, I would, I'd try to engage a relationship with God so I can... A relationship you know. with God won't be possible while you don't want to know yourself. So what's the point in trying to have a relationship with God when you don't want to know yourself? See, see what I would do is this. If I worked out that I don't want to know me, I don't... Really, what you're saying is you don't want yourself. You don't want to be yourself. You don't want to know yourself. You don't want yourself. This is a common problem, right, for many people. You don't yep. want yourself. If I felt that and I knew that to be true, my very next course of action is, okay, I know that the only way I can change is by feeling. Humility tells me that. The only way I'm going to change on this belief is by feeling it. Feeling that I don't want to know myself. Yeah, feeling you don't want to know yourself. So, and then when you feel you don't want to know yourself, you will then feel why. That will be the subsequent result of feeling that you don't want to know yourself. You will then feel why you don't want to know so yourself. So the why won't come before the, the feeling initially. No. See, many of you are trying to put the why before the feeling. Yeah, we were You're having this discussion doing this all last the time. Night. And I keep saying to you, there is a feeling above a feeling, not a thought. Right? Many of you still are trying to have thoughts before you have feelings. So, so what you do is you go, okay, I know I'm not progressing, I'm not, not doing this, I know I'm not doing that. I wonder why that is. And you use your mind and you're trying to work out why. No, no, stop. Just stop all of that. Feel that you don't want to know. Feel it. How much you don't want to know about yourself. Feel that. Feel how angry you are about having to know yourself. Feel, feel those feelings. Well, I think the first step for me is not wanting to know myself, is that I'd have to let go of my control to know myself first, wouldn't I? So feel your control. Yeah. How, feel your control. Sit down with your control every day and notice every single time you try to control. Feel it. Feel the level of your control. That's feeling your addiction. Feel your addiction. Feel the level of control. Feel how much you want to control. And when you feel it, you'll work out why you want to control. And you won't work it out here because the, thought, the feelings will just come up. Oh, this, I want to control because every time I don't get to control, I'm try, you, know, you work out that you're trying to avoid some emotion. One might be only one emotion you're trying to avoid. And you'll work it out because you've felt that you want control. Many of you don't even realise you want control. I'm putting, I'm putting to you that every single one of you who are single in the audience today, unless you're below 25, every single one of you in the audience today who is single below 25 wants control. That's one of the reasons why you're not with a partner, because you want control. Right? Many of you who are with a partner right today still want control, and you've got a partner you could control. You took many years to find him or her, right? <laughs> And now you've got him, Hillary, you're not going to let him go because you want control. Right? They are your ideal partner because they are the person that gives you everything that you want. Right? Many of us are not willing to see that. We're not willing to see that. We're not willing to see what's going on inside of ourselves in reality. Right? So, so, how many of you are ladies who are single, just out of interest? Yeah? Right. It's almost you know, probably 40% of the audience, maybe. That's a lot in a percentage, isn't it? 
40% uh, of the audience. Have you ever given consideration to the fact that you're not very pleasant to live with? Have you given consideration to that? Okay, what do you want to do about it? You see, at the moment, you're letting your fear dictate that. The reason why you've become unpleasant to live with is because of your fear. It's only because of your fear. It's the things you're afraid of facing inside of yourself, feelings you're afraid of having inside of yourself that would cause that to occur. Right? Feel that. Feel that. Allow yourself to feel it because when you feel it, you'll realize why. When you realize why, you can change. But you're not going to change until you realize why. You see, feel what you, what, what you currently don't want. See, many times I say to people, when you, many people have asked this question, maybe I should just develop my relationship with God more. Well, you can't develop a relationship with God when you don't want to know yourself. And you don't want to be truly honest with God about yourself. So it would be far more, from God's perspective, God will feel far, far closer to you if you honour the fact that you don't want yourself, you don't want to feel yourself, and you feel how much you don't want to. In that moment, you'll be closer to God than you've ever been before, actually. Right? You don't have to do anything else other than feel that in that moment. But what I see most of you trying to do is you're trying to work out what's going on before you feel. Your feeling of fear will stop you from even working it out. You need to feel your fear first and the less let go of some of the fear and then you'll work it out. But many of you want to know before you feel. Is that not a problem for the majority of us in fact? We want to know things before we feel them. Because we want to know that we're not crazy, we're not stupid, that it's a real feeling, that we have justified having the feeling. We even go to other people, you see, I have this feeling because. Who cares why you have the feeling? Just feel it. Like many of you still get involved in this discussion. You, how, how have you felt this week? I feel, I feel this, and I realised that it's because of this and because of that and because of this that I feel that. Well, what about you? So, oh, yes, I had this, I had this thing come up and I realised that because of this. Because, what's going on? Why are you doing this for? It's a waste of time because you're not feeling it. If you felt it truly, you wouldn't need to do it, in fact. You wouldn't even need to discuss it with another person if you felt it truly. You would just feel it. We are addicted to having other people be involved in our own emotional work. We are addicted because we want certain things from them. We want them to make us feel safe. We want to know that because someone else is going through it, it means that my feeling is valid. We want to know that because someone else is experiencing a similar thing or they've had an emotion this week, that that means I'm allowed to have one too. And it's all just rubbish actually. It's all just our fear dictating our f further progress. And what are the fears? They are the fears you don't see. The fear of other people's approval. The fear of acceptance. The fear of not having any acceptance. The fear of not having other people like you. The fear that other people don't agree with you and you're the only person on the planet who actually feels that particular thing. The fear that you're stupid, that you're strange, that you're crazy, that you're weird. That you're... All of these fears are the fears that you try to make go away by having somebody else come along and have a chat with them about your feelings. You're making all, so, so you're actually in addiction dealing with your emotion. Now, can you really ever deal with an emotion while you're in addiction? Of course you can't. You're only going to be dealing with the emotion that your fear is allowing you to deal with. So for, for many, I feel what's going on is this. Our fear has become like a prison, right, of our own making. So you imagine, for many of us, this is what it's like. This is what it's like. We've got this prison. And our fear, by the way, dictates how big the prison is. So the less fear we have, the bigger the prison is. In other words, we have more freedom. Right? The more fear we have, the smaller the prison is. In other words, it's like a solitary confinement cell. 
when our fear is very, very large. And we have stuck ourselves inside of this. We are constrained by this prison that we have created, that our fear dictates. And while that remains the case, you will only allow yourself, even when you discover divine truth and you discover the way to God is through emotional change, you will find that you will only allow yourself experience the, to experience emotion that the boundaries of your fear will accept. So if your fear is very large, your cell will be very small and the boundaries of your fear, that what your fear will allow you to actually process emotionally, will be very small, very tight. You'll only be able to get into certain things emotionally and work the way through them in that boundary. If your fear is, a, you know, is less than that, then your boundaries might be larger, but you still have boundaries. And everything outside of this boundary, this is what I see for many, is everything outside of the boundary is the real stuff that's going to help your relationship with God. Feeling that is going to help your relationship with God the most. Feeling this and anything inside of it will only do what? It will only let you have a relationship with God that's constrained by exactly the same boundary. That's all it's going to do. Your whole life, for the rest of your life, will be dictated to by what your fear will allow you to experience. And unless that changes, unless something changes where your fear and what it allows you to experience grows, nothing will change in your life. And so what I see many of you doing is you allow certain emotions. So that might be an emotion of grief. So you, you, know, you, you cry that much to that boundary. And that might be the direction of your grief. You cry to that boundary, you will cry no more. Because your fear is telling you to stop. And you honour your fear before you honour anything else. So you don't honour God there, you don't honour love, you don't have faith, you don't honour humility, you don't want more truth in that place. You only will allow yourself to experience grief to that point. That's it. <clears throat> Some of you will only allow yourself to experience grief if, if it's a spirit with you. In other words, you're experiencing the grief of spirits who are atta attracted to you or attached to you before you will let yourself feel any of your own grief. So, you know, for many of you, all of the crying that you've ever done, it wasn't yours. That seems to be a waste. All right? And the reason why you do that is because your fear will only let you do that. So it's your fear. You want somebody to be with you all the time when you experience an emotion. And if it's not a person, you prefer it to be a spirit person. Right. And so you let yourself process that way. So some of you, a complete denial of this level of control that you have over your lives with your fear. 